Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome back to Fallen London. In this episode we're going to be looking at the exceptional story for May, the stag and the shark. It, it sounds like it's going to be quite an interesting little one so let's see what it's all about. I say, a young man in a pristine blazer is standing amid a shabbily attired family selling grilled rats. You couldn't take a photograph of me with these people could you? The smallest child gives him an incredulous stare as he passes you the brand new equipment. To show my chums, he clarifies, straightening his tie. So we have a few options here, we can ensure the photograph flatters him. It should not be hard, that, that blazer really is fine. Or we can take the photograph from an unbecoming angle. The request is grotesque, the photograph should be as well. No, we will make him look like a fine young man. Juxtaposed against the ragged clothes and careworn faces of his new associates, the young man's round cheeks are immaculately tailored. Vestments make him appear cherubic. Splendid, he says, giving you a handful of coins, carelessly produced from a pocket. The smallest child looks at him expectedly. Don't worry, young chap, he says, ruffling the boy's hair. I'll have someone send you over a print. Oof. Oh, he's one of those people. Like the... All I could say is about who's from Britain that all I can see in my brain is private school toffs. Just 100%. <laughs> I to deal with them enough times in my life. Right, so I'm guessing it's going to be the season of explosions. Unlock the stag and the shark. Wonderful. The young stags are having a party. So we have to go to a private party. Here it is. You are passing an imposing townhouse when a young man in a monogrammed blazer flings your an arm around you. What oh, Bunty, he slurs. Come back inside. Don't make me listen to that bore on my own. He squints at you. I say, Bunty, you're looking rather odd. He mumbles before staggering onto a bench and passing out. Beyond, a group of identically blazered youths gather by the door. A sign reads, Young Stags, Members Only. So we could either... Oh, you could be a member of the Young Stags Club? Well, I am not. But uh, So we can either steal his blazer, it's a ruthless choice, or we can convince the other stags that we're a member of the clubs. If they've had as much wine as their fellow, it will not be hard. As much as I like the idea of getting a monogrammed blazer... Oh... Let's just convince them. You invent a lark on the spot, and the stags howl with laughter as you embellish your story with ever more ribald details. The more outrageous the antidote becomes, the more convinced they are of its authenticity. The stag slaps you on the back as you cross the threshold into their expensively furbished club. In their midst, a stag wearing only a stolen mitre drinks his way along a line of brimming brandy sniffers. He makes it to the twelfth before admitting defeat. What a lark, cries another, wiping tears of mirth from his ruddy cheeks. Oh, this is going to be entertaining. The air is thick with cigar smoke and raucous laughter. A pair of discarded trousers dangles from a stuffed Z-beast mounted over the fireplace. The door to the brandy room is closed. A, young, a group of young stags compare larks by the bar, while atop of the billiard table another holds forth about something he clearly deems important. Talk to the young stag on the billiard table. Is he the boar? The idle heir stands on the billiard table, recounting his recent tour of spite. Quite fascinating, he orates to his disinterested audience. You wouldn't believe the conditions. So we can either... How novel, Spite is rather off the beaten track for someone of his social stature, or isn't visiting the Spite for the sake of a story a bit tasteless. People do live there. Uh, I think how novel. <laughs> he basks in the affirmation. Well, quite, he replies eagerly. I tell you, he hops down from the billiard table. Considering what a frightfully interesting jaunt it was, the others don't seem terribly impressed. Indeed, his fellow stags have already stopped paying attention, and are now hatching a ploy to relieve a unsuspecting priest of his cassock. He leads you to a quiet corner. But don't worry, between you and me, I've actually got something rather smashing planned for the next lark. I'm planning a bound shark watching voyage at sea. 
it'll be jolly exciting, especially on the sort of rickety old tub I've chartered. Quite the lark. His eyes suddenly come alight. I say, do you want to come? Uh, what, a, what about sharks? Or at least, what does he think they are? Well, they're sharks, he says, his eyes alight. But they've been found. Like a roast, you know? To stop the stuffing falling out. If there are further implications to this concept, they do not trouble him. <laughs> Why does he want to go shark watching, especially aboard an unsound vessel? He lowers his voice. I know us stags are a cut above most Londoners, but sometimes I wonder whether I'm a cut above most stags. My fellows aren't interested in how commoners live, but when I think of how they're terribly difficult and dangerous lives, I just think, gosh, how intriguing. Stags have to do larks anyway, so I'm using mine to find out what it's like being poor. I've tried to explain it to the others, but they just make fun of me. I thought if I really garb their attention, they'll listen. Hopefully, shark watching will do the trick. <laughs> Live like a poor person. God, this is... Oh dear. Let's rejoin the party. There were still things we haven't done. We can talk to him in a minute. The idle air clamps back onto the billiard table. His fellows shoot spitballs at him, staining the flock wallpaper. Uh, let's uh, compare larks with the other young stags. They're having a terrific time. And then... Grafors a floppy-haired stag, slopping mushroom wine on the carpet. I told the butler that if he wanted his unmentionables back, he'd have to climb up to the roof and get them himself. His audience falls about it. Paradox sims of mirth? Oof. Okay, so we have three choices here. We can either declare that the young stags represent everything that's wrong with London. Their unearned privilege is thoughtlessly deployed. We can remain silent. They seem to be holding the conversation well enough on their own. Or we can share one of our own larks. They were more exciting than the stags. I think we should play them at their own game, even though in reality, I think I would probably go with the declare that everything wrong with London, but it will share one of our own larks. P -p prison falters the floppy haired raconteur. Trousers did you have to steal to end up there? The other stags are uncharacteristically quiet. The idea of facing the consequences of one's actions having quite unnerved them. Here, interjects a way-faced stag, eager to break the tension. Let's all have a bracing drink, and say no more about it. Oh no, should we venture into the brandy room? Whoever is within has sequestered themselves from the festivities. A group of older men in nondescript but expensive attire stop talking as you enter the room. One in particular glares at you, before staring back into the fire. Go outside of the rest of the stags, says another from beneath a formidable moustache. The Baron's got a lot on his mind. Uh, shall we try? It's a 45% chance. What troubles him? Oh, we succeeded. Wonderful. Damned if I've seen your face before, barks the ill-humoured Baron. The new ones all look the same to me. I'm only here because of my son. We are all... He indicates the other brandy drinkers, as it's not the done thing to be seen with the stags once one's glory days are over. That boy keeps trying to make larks into something they're not, and I thought if enough of us old chaps explained how things work, he'd give up, and finally run down Ladybones Road in his knickerbockers. But we spoke to him for an hour, and it made no difference. Hmm, let's eavesdrop from outside the door. The boy doesn't understand the point of a proper lark. They're a sacrifice to show your commitment to the stags. Jolly good fun, yes, but they're not meant to be improving. And they're certainly not bloody charity. A bit of debauchery so we know someone's our sort. And they know that we know what they did. Shows a chap's trustworthy. And all this rot about slums and marshes. He's supposed to inherit London for pretty's sake. This city is his heritage and his responsibility, yet he ignores everything that matters in favour of mucking about in places that don't. Well, we'll examine the Z-Beast. It hasn't been dusted for decades. An ignoble end. The beast is dilapidated, with only a few shreds of leathery skin still clinging to its skull. Between its clouded glass eyes is a jagged hole, but whether this is the site of the fatal harpoon or more recent damage at the hands of a drunken stag is impossible to tell. 
Pushing aside the trousers reveals an incredibly tarnished brass plaque, which attributes the beast's slaughterer to someone with a triple-barreled name. Ooh, triple barrel, that's how you know he's top of society. Well, I think we've done everything, so let's go back to talk to the idler. Of course I would love to go see some bound sharks. Sharks? A rickety old tub? It sounds delightful. Oh, hurrah, he says, clapping his hands. Meet me at Wolfstack Docks when you're ready to leave. Don't worry about a thing. I've hired a fisher to take us to the feeding grounds. She's a funny sort, but knows a lot about bound sharks. Replied to my notice as soon as I'd put it in the gazette. His smile falters. I say, perhaps you could tell my father, the Baron, that you're coming along. He signs the checks, you see. He was here, but I suppose he's withdrawn to the brandy room. Uh, why does he want to go? Yeah, we've done all this. So we need to go speak to the man in the brandy room. <laughs> Raise the issue of expenses with the ill-humoured Baron. You've agreed to join his son's bound shark watching voyage. Another adventure? Blast. I can't stop funding them. He'd just go without my help, and there's no telling what would happen then. The ill-humoured Baron lowers his voice. I want him back in one piece. I'll charter my own steamer and follow just out of sight, so you need to make sure his rust bucket doesn't go too fast. Do that, he says, swirling the bland brandy around his glass, and I'll make it worth your while. I know you don't need money. You're a stag, but I know things, things I might share with someone I trust. Ooh, we gained a move in the great game. Could be interesting. Return to the party, do we have to... Let's return home. It would best not to outstay your welcome. As you make your way to the door, a drunken stag heckles the idle air. For the last bloody time, no one's interested, he jeers. The rest of the group slur their assent. The air stumbles down from the billiard table, his face red. We only put up with you because our fathers make us, says another, jabbing the air in the chest. If your father didn't own half of Ladybones Road, none of us would give you the time of day. That's not very nice. Oh, a steamer for hire. Moments after you arrive at Wolfstack Docks, the idle air, clad in gleaming new oilskins, bounds towards you. Isn't it frightful, he says, beaming. Rust everywhere. None of my fellows have ever even seen a boat this good decrepit, let alone ridden one. Behind him is a dilapidated fishing steamer. On the creaking platoon beside it is a shabbily dressed captain uncoils frayed rope from around a cleat. She is wearing dark glasses that render her expression unreadable. Uh, make the inscrutable fisher's acquaintance. You're about to board her vessel. It would only be polite. She gives you what might be an appraising look. Through her dark glasses make it impossible to tell for sure. He's only just told me you'd be joining us, she says in a crisper accent than you might have imagined, given her occupation. Apparently, you're the best of friends, although I'd ra prefer more notice before adding another to our number. He is the one paying, so you'll hear no argument from me. Still, I wonder if you might join me in the wheelhouse once we have embarked. I'd like to get a measure of my crew. Speak with the idle air. He is evidently excited. I'm so glad you're here, the idle air gushes. At first I thought it would just be a rather jolly to have a chum aboard, but actually, I do need your help. He draws you close and lowers his voice. I want this voyage to be absolutely thrilling, and that means going fast. I don't know much about boats, so it would be awfully decent of you to do what needs doing. Don't worry, it's not like any real harm's going to come to us. We're stags! Ah, oh, great, so he wants me to go quick. His father wants me to go slew. Ah. Oh, I almost forgot, says the idle heir, rummaging in his voluptuous pockets of his oil skins. Father asked me to give you this. He holds out a crumpled envelope. He said you should read it straight away. Behind him, the inscrutable fisher waits beside the steamer. Let's open the envelope. Espionage. Ooh. There is yet more that I would ask of you. Stags must be careful whom they associate with, so I have used my contacts to learn more about this fisher. It would appear there is a gap in her biography, one that I believe you must fill if you were to keep my son safe. She has roots in one of London's oldest families, but abruptly broke contact with them a decade ago. 
They have no interest in learning how she fares now, but I do. Find out what you can and act accordingly. A down payment is enclosed. We got a compromising document and a volume of collated research. The fact that she's wearing dark sunglasses makes me feel as though there is something amiss with this Fisher. It's time for us to leave, says the inscrutable Fisher. The idle air's cheeks glow with anticipation. We will not be able to return to London for some time. The idle air stumbles as the fishing vessel coughs into life and lurches away from the pontoon, but the inscrutable fisher, barely visible from behind the clouded glass of the wheelhouse, maintains her composure. She guides you away from Wolfstack docks and into the open sea, whereupon the lights of London fade from view. So here we're on the undersea. A dilapidated deck. Rust flakes off every surface like dead bark from an ancient tree. The deck creaks with every step, and the noise of the deceptic engine is deafening. The smell of a thousand catches emanates from the fishing net balled up at the stern. In the wheelhouse, the inscrutable fisher helms the fishing vessel, while the air stands at the bow like a well-coiffed figurehead. Uh, let's have a look then. Should we enter the wheelhouse? The inscrutable fisher has asked you to meet her. The inscrutable fisher stares out to Z from behind her dark glasses. She grips the fishing vessel's wheel with hands clad in thick knitted gloves. One wall of the wheelhouse is covered by a chart puckered with damp. Beneath it is a pile of blankets that the fisher must be using as a bed while the idle air sleeps in the steamer's only cabin. She expressed an interest in talking to you privately to get the measure of you. I was surprised when I saw your friend's advertisement, she muses. It's not often a young person of means seeks to experience a life like mine. It's rather charming of him. Gorsh, too, but one must forgive him that. He's led a sheltered life. He told me something of his father. I can sympathize with one who has grown up in such rigid expectations. That said, such an upbringing can skew one's sense of right and wrong. While I wouldn't credit him with much guile, he may be concealing something. I need you to tell me everything you know about him and his father. So we can tell the fisher what we know of the heir, considering the matter will not commit you to the choice. I don't think I want to tell her. Well, we can tell her what we think of the, the, the heir. We don't think he's hiding anything. Stag's honor, while I admire your loyalty, I find it difficult to believe there's nothing he isn't telling me. Everyone in the Neath has a secret. I believe that the boy is unhappy, though he may not realize it. I rarely get an opportunity to make a difference to anyone's life but my own, so I'd like to help him, but I can't if I don't know what really troubles him. If you're really his friend, you'll tell me what you know about him and his father. Let's see what it says. The ill humoured baron is secretly following in a fishing vessel in a much larger steamer. In doing so, he hopes to protect his son from anything that might menace him. Yes, it would be wise to learn more about the uh, fisher before we do anything like this. Uh, what qualifies her for this assignment? What does she know about bound sharks? I scrape my living from the Z, says the inscrutable fisher. So I've encountered the creatures that prey on the same fish I do. Bound sharks are the most captivating. Those who have caught one say their bindings are held in place with rods driven deep into their flesh. She continues, and that they live in agony as a result. If that is true, then it is wrong to kill them. When pressed to explain, she shakes her head. Someone's done that to them for a reason. They wouldn't want to interfere with a plan. Mm, she has a point. Let's have a look around the wheelhouse. You could learn something about this inscrutable character. You begin your investigation by peering at the damp chart, but before you can decipher its symbols, she gives a pointed cough. If you want to be helpful, she says flatly, you can fetch my lunch from the galley. You won't be able to perform a thorough search of the wheelhouse while she is here. Kind of makes sense. I'm sure she's the sort of person who would notice. Uh, ah, tell the inscrutable fisher there's a problem with the heads. 76% chance. 
We spend a confidence mile. Let's spend a confidence mile to ensure a second chance. Oh, we succeeded anyway. A grizzly tail. I did explain to your friend how they worked, she sighs, pulling on an apron, but it appears he wasn't listening. Don't worry, I'm sure I've seen worse. Once, I found a jellyfish tentacle. The details are horrifying, and it will be a while before you are content to sit down on anything before checking it first. Nevertheless, the ruse works, and the inscrutable fisher ties a handkerchief over her nose before leaving you alone in the wheelhouse. We got two tales of terror. <laughs> so, we can examine the chart. Where are the bound shark fishing rounds? The chart is muddled with age and damp but you are able to distinguish land masses from blotches of mildew. What first look like waves are, you realize, shark fins penciled onto the parchment in a cluster to the south. Two dotted lines lead into the cluster, one originating from London and another from a corner of the map obscured by mildew. There is a cross at the convergence of the lines with the word Rendezvous penciled just above. The route from London corresponds with the fishing vessels, so it appears the fisher is planning a meeting with some other party. Ooh. That's not good. Let's search her bed. What is concealed beneath those threadbare blankets? While sliding your hand underneath the fisher's pillow, your fingers brush against something smooth and hard. You pull out a long, thin piece of carved bone? Ivory? About the width of your hand. It could be a talisman or a weapon. Notches have been gouged into either end, and they are worn as if of repeated use. There is no harm holding onto it. Well, we can return to the deck. By the time you come back, the weary Fisher will have returned to her post. So let's see how the idle air is faring on this voyage. Oh, the idle air is standing on the brow in a pose that might look heroic were he not having to steady himself against the railings. Ah, do we tell him about his... Can we? Ah, we... To keep his son safe, the ill-human barrel is secretly following in a fish yeah, vessel with the steamer. The idle air is trying to experience an authentic voyage and might not appreciate being shadowed. Then again, he might be touched. Uh, I'm not sure yet. Since the day. Let's descend into the engine room. It's probably no more dangerous than the rest of the vessel. The heat and noise from the engine room are almost overwhelming, and everything is coated in oil and soot. There is a hand-sized hole sawn out of one of the panels of the metal floor. The furnace's grate is slightly ajar, a soft glow emanating from within. A tarnished brass chute opens out over the floor, but there's no coal to be seen. Hmm. Let's uh, examine the furnace. It powers the fishing vessel. The ill-humoured Barrett asks you to ensure that the fishing vessel maintains a low speed while his son has requested you make it go as fast as possible. However, there is currently so little coal in the furnace that it's doubtful that it will ever reach its destination, let alone at a speed that would excite the air or thwart his father. Hmm. Should we reach into the hole? The metal edge looks sharp, but the hole may conceal something of interest. You deftly navigate the ragged metal, and your fingers touch upon a discarded candle stub. Though you reach into every corner of the small hole, you discover nothing except some small indentations on either side. The hole looks like it was deliberately sawn into the floor. Surely, it must have some more interesting purpose. We'll need a tool to uncover the hole's purpose. Well, we have a tool. So let's put the fisher's strange implement into the hole. Its length is equal to the hole's diameter. Could be a handle. Kneeling on the hot metal floor next to the furnace, you push the carved handle into the hole until the chiseled notches match the indentations. Sweating from exertion and heat, you lift the wall panel away. Underneath, in what must surely be a secret compartment fashioned by the fisher, is a sheaf of documents labelled Recruitment Targets. The well-thumbed dossier contains information on the hierarchies and personnel of several powerful groups from across London. At the end are several pages on the young stags, and a list of the influential positions held by former members. Well, she's going to know that uh, I've done this, right? <laughs> 
<laughs> I feel like we can't hide this for much longer. But she's definitely hiding something. Should we explore the heir's cabin? Might as well. See what we can find out about him. The damp wooden door to the fishing steamer's only cabin is shut. Open the cabin door. If the idle heir has a secret, there is likely to be a clue in his cabin. It is locked. The damp wooden door moves a little in its rotten frame, but is held fast by a large brass lock. You'll need to acquire the key if you are to explore the cabin. Oh. Well, I think I'm going to have to end the episode here, but thank you very much for watching. We will continue to explore this ship in the next episode. We need to get the Fisher her lunch from the galley. That seems to be something we need to do. But please let me know what you think. Please like, subscribe. Your comments are greatly appreciated. And as always, I'll see you next time.